In today's episode, we'll discuss the intense launch coaster that followed some historic attractions, good and bad. Welcome to Airtime Traveler. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Roller Coaster History Podcast. You are listening to Airtime Traveler. My name is Nathan Grace, and as always, I am joined by my wife and lovely co host. Hey, I'm Haley Grace. And thank you for tuning in to episode seven of the podcast. If you haven't had a chance to listen to our previous episodes, go and check those out. And uh, also, we did a you know, uh, we did a trip report for King's Dominion. We'll have trip reports coming throughout the year for the other parks we visit. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. So if you haven't listened to the podcast before, basically here at Airtime Traveler, we every episode we take one roller coaster and we go into, we dive into the history of that one individual coaster. So I am a coaster enthusiast and have been for a long time. And my wife is a member of the GP or the general public. So I'm here to share these coaster history stories with her, and she's here to um, add some color commentary and make sure I don't uh, bore everybody too much. So I'm the fun one, and you're the boring one. <laughs> I mean, that's the is that, that's is the that rude one. That's the, rude, that's the rude way of putting it, but I suppose so. <laughs> I mean, so. If you, I guess if you say so. <laughs> so. Well, have you run into any coaster news this week? Anything you've seen? I have, from the but industry? I can't remember like what I saw. Oh, the bat! Oh Losing yeah, its wheel? The, yeah. So we went to Kings Island I guess, last month, I guess a month, yeah. a month ago, and this week it had an, an issue where like a wheel came off and some part of the track got dented, and so. Um, I didn't see anything about like anybody being on the ride when it happened, so must have been yeah. like during a test run or something. But yeah, that's uh, um, yeah, that's crazy. So I know I've had people ask me that like like if stuff like that makes me nervous, like to ride roller coasters when like I see coasters have damage like that, but. Yeah. Really, it doesn't make me nervous. Like, I mean, roller coasters have maintenance issues just the same way that a car does. And right. really, you're safer on a roller coaster than you are driving on the highway to the amusement park. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I know that the parks are doing their best to, to keep the maintenance up. And, you know, there hasn't been um, a, a death on a roller coaster that was not related to, like, a health issue. Because, cause like, sometimes people have, like, a, guess, a, really, yeah, like a heart problem. Yeah, because the happened. Not too long ago, yes, there's but... there's been some non coaster amusement park um, fatalities recently, but none not on a coaster in a while. Other than people that had like a, a health condition that they didn't know about or something like that. So, so really, the the odds of uh, something happening are are pretty low. And so, um, yeah, stuff like that doesn't make me nervous, and more makes me worried. Like, what's the park going to do to? know fix the ride and some people like oh they're just gonna tear it down i'm like i think that's a little dramatic but we'll see um, yeah it would be a good spot to put something there it would but i mean i really like that ride i loved that ride it was a lot of fun but it like didn't get any attention so no it doesn't line like it was hot on yeah well it's it's hidden so much behind the trees i think people people really don't even realize it's there unless they're looking for it so so I did see, um, I saw a video this week that I was just going to bring up really quick in our intro here. I saw this video of like a dad that took his daughter on a roller coaster and was, it was like some TikTok or Instagram post. I can't remember, but, and like, she just hated it. And the, the thing that bothered me about it though, was one, when I figured out what roller coaster it was, it was Iron Gwazi. Which is a brand new, massive, two hundred foot hybrid hybrid coaster in Bush Gardens, Tampa. So, if you have it, first of all, if you're a parent and you have a kid, 
um, make sure you work your kids up to the big coasters because you might scar them for life if you put them on something that big before yeah. they've been on something. Can you imagine know. doing that to Parker? Here, Parker. Yeah, just, just like never. Put on rock and roller coaster as your first roller coaster. Like yeah. So, but anyway, she she was terrified, and he had, the pictures were all throughout the ride, which means he had his phone on him, taking like selfies while they're on the ride, which is. Completely irresponsible. No, no, yeah. So, so I had a lot of issues with that, and I just I saw that pop up in my mainstream social media this week, and thought I'd mention that. So, number one, never take your phone on a ride unless it's in a very secure pocket, Zippered which pocket. yeah, zipper or, or velcro button. pockets or a, or a button. Yeah. But even buttons, like please make sure it's like actually the stay yep. button. Like it's just crazy. And if you have kids, don't ruin roller coasters for them by taking them on something insane for their first ever roller coaster so yep. sometimes it's fine like sometimes you'll have a kid that just it's you tip yeah you put them on Iraguazi and they're like that's awesome and you know you've got a coaster enthusiast in the making but sometimes if, if it's somebody like I was when I was terrified of coasters as I was younger like I don't know, that, that, that would scar some kids from ever getting on another ride ever again. So. Well, the big, the first coaster I rode was an Idlewild, but, like, the first, like, actual big roller coaster I rode was Phantom. Phantom's Revenge, right? <laughs> yeah. That's a big coaster to be, like, your first adult coaster. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, it's a good thing you didn't get scarred. You were kind of, you I were the was, one that I was, was like, scared for a little bit to get back on it, but, like, I loved it after that. Like, yeah, yeah. So... But I still remember, like, that, like, the first experience I had was just clutching onto the lap bar because I thought I was going to fly out of the <laughs> yeah. seat. So, but it was fun. Yeah. It was a good time. So. Well, today we are going to be talking about Knott's Berry Farm. So, um, I mentioned this in our last episode, but, so Knott's Berry Farm, I had the opportunity to go for the first time earlier this year. Um, because I, I tagged it onto a, a work trip that I had. Uh, Haley was unable to go, but I'm going to try to make the, the episode as, as relatable to Haley as possible. So, um, yeah, so the coaster we're going to be talking about today is Accelerator at Knott's Berry Farm. Okay. So, um, just before we get into that, I just wanted to do like a brief, like five minute trip report of Knott's Berry Farm since. I went on that trip a few months before we started this podcast, so I never got to do like a, a full blown trip report. So just like I said, just a five minute trip report, just for for one for our audience, but two so that you can kind of get an idea of the park as we're as we're talking about this. So so the main entrance looks great. Um, it's like I think I've mentioned this to you, but Knott's Berry Farm is like downtown, and it's like yeah, you told me it's like blocked in. Basically. It's blocked in. You got businesses and houses all the way around, so you're basically um, you put you pull off of this road and to get to Knott's Berry Farm, and the entrance is like right there on a main street. Mm-hmm. So it's easy for someone to like just like pull over and drop you off at the entrance, which is what my my Uber driver did. So it's super yeah. easy. Um, and then there there is a parking lot, obviously, but. Um, the just the way it's designed, it's super easy to drop you off. And there's a whole shopping market over there too, like down, down this down this road right here. In fact, you can see the shopping area there, the California Marketplace, and that's where the diner is that started everything. And so, so anyway, but the entrance looks awesome. Silver Bullets Cobra Roll is like standing above the entrance. You can see it from outside the park. So as the coaster's running, like you can see it before you even get into the park, which is cool. And then so as you walk in, they have like a small little windmill here with like a sign of the park. And then if you go to the right, this is the Camp Snoopy area, which is where Sierra Sidewinder is. And then um, a bunch of, you know, that's where like kind of all the kitty rides are. Okay. If you go to the left over here, this is where the ghost town section is, which is one of the most popular areas of the park. And that's where that's where Ghost Rider is, which is their most popular coaster. Um, and it's just like it feels like an old Wild West town, like the way it's designed and with like businesses lining, you know, somewhere. Was so like some... the theming pretty good? The, the one thing I will say about about Knott's Berry Farm compared to some of the other Cedar Fair parks 
I would call like King's Island and King's Dominion an amusement park. Knott's Berry Farm is 100% a theme park. Oh, like cool. that's, they really, um, and that's how they were been designed from the beginning is to to really have a theme and a story that they're trying to tell and so the ghost town section is really great um it stretches all the way this this whole side of the park basically is the ghost town section so mm. the river rapid ride is themed to that there's a the mine ride the the um what else ghost rider like i mentioned there's pony express is over there is another small roller coaster so all of that is themed to like Wild West and old mine town, ghost town type of deal. So, and it looks really great. They did a really good job with that. So then in the back of the park here is kind of like, so so back over here by like hang time and accelerator is what's called the boardwalk. So it's, you know, your typical boardwalk theming with like surfboards and beach theming and stuff like that. And like a kind of 50s. Um, style theming so like accelerator the cars on accelerator are themed after a 57 chevy Belair, mm. and hang time there it's it's a surfing themed coaster so that whole area is just kind of like playing like beach boys type Sweet. music and so it's really cool i like that yep so <sighs> apologize girls i'm boring already <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to keep me from not being boring. <laughs> Forget, I'm a mom of a toddler. Oh, that's true. Maybe I'm not boring. Maybe you're just tired. Maybe. Or maybe both. Or both. <laughs> Don't say that. People get to turn the podcast off. <laughs> no, you're not boring. So, and then the back here, there's Charleston Circle. It's kind of a, a smaller section, but that's where their um, their shooting ride is back there. Knott's Berry Tales. Um, Did you go on that one? I did. So was it fun? Yeah, it was pretty fun. It's they just opened it in 2021, so it's like a brand new, oh, brand was new it ride. Similar to like, um, the to one the Hershey? one at Hershey. It's similar with like similar theming. Yeah. You were, if I remember correctly, you were shooting boysenberries. Was like uh-huh. your thing that you were shooting out of? Oh, and your 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 gun was like a like a boysenberry jam jar. So it was pretty fun, and they were they were pumping the scent of boysenberry well, throughout the whole. Similar, horror. like just boysenberry theme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, and then it smells like chocolate. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so then the last section here I really haven't talked about is the Fiesta Village here, which is kind of themed to like um, like Mayan culture and like because like in Southern California you have a lot of that culture that comes over from from mexico and the hispanic culture so mm-hmm. they have like a, a big mayan temple that's in front of one of the i think it's mayan it might be aztec i'm not I'm, I'm not familiar with the differences between them but there's like a big temple in front of one of the roller coasters over there so so it's cool they, they do a good cool. job with the theming so the whole park it has a great atmosphere obviously it's a it's a small park because of you know it's being kind of being landlocked, landlocked. And so it's easy to get around. It also, it has pros and cons though, because it makes it difficult for them to make additions to the park right. going forward. So, um, but yeah, but I, I really liked it. It was, it was a great time. So the food was also great. I could spend a lot of time talking about the food, but um, it was, <laughs> it was really good. The boysenberry, you know, yeah. they, they put boysenberry in everything. And you told you, me about it. well, and you think you're like boysenberry barbecue sauce. Ooh, like that sounds, yeah. that sounds, it was eh. really, really but good. oh, it was amazing. Like I tried it and I was like, that was, that was so good. So um, yeah, so I really enjoyed it. Um, I had a really good time at Knott's Berry Farm. My ranking for the coasters, I'll just give you my top three. I won't go through all of them, but my, my number one was Accelerator and then Hang Time and then Ghost Rider was my top three. And I know some people will disagree with that as we'll, we'll get into what the coaster bot rankings and everything are, but yeah, that was my, that was my top three at the park. So, so yeah, so that's my brief trip report to to Knott's Berry Farm so I really enjoyed it. I wish I could have gone. Yeah me too me too so. Next time. Yep it's um it's hard for me to say whether I because like clearly I enjoyed the roller coasters at um King's Dominion and King's Island more but the atmosphere at Knott's and the food was awesome so it, it, they definitely feel different. And, and like I said, this one, you know, definitely more of a theme park where the others are, you know, regional amusement parks. So, but yeah, it was.
was it was really good. I'm hopeful the next time I can go, you can come with me. I hope so. so. Yeah. I really I've never been to California. Period. So going there would be a lot of fun. It would be. But we have to make a trip to Disneyland. Yep. That's true. I mean, they're right next to each other, basically. So I know you said you sent me pictures of like Disneyland rides from the road. Well, that was where um, our hotel was. It's still, but, like yeah. you could just see it, like <clears throat> right there. Yeah. So it would be fun. So, all right. So now accelerator. So, and the reason I picked accelerator to talk about is because it is very similar to a ride that you have been on. It so, kind of looks like Intimidator. Well, so it's not not Intimidator, but um, Storm Runner is the one that oh, is. Oh, okay. It's very similar to Storm Runner. So it's, it's a launch coaster. It's yes, it is a launch coaster, and okay. it's the it's the same exact same model Storm Runner, almost the exact same speed of launch. Um, Storm Runner's longer, so but you know, and then Accelerator doesn't go upside down. So, but anyway, you've been on a storm runner, so you kind of so know. I probably the... would like this one, like a lot. Yes, you would like this one. You would. So, yeah. So that's anyway. That's why I decided to do this one, just so you at least had a kind of an, ex- an idea, an idea of what okay. the ride experience is like. So, yeah. sounds great. So, peachy keen. Yep. So, like <laughs> I said, Accelerator was my favorite at the park, and I'm, I think we've mentioned this before, but I'm a sucker for a launch coaster. So, you know, I enjoyed... Do you know what your dad's favorite ride was? This was his favorite, too. Yeah? In fact, his top three is... Well, I don't know what his number three would be, but his number one and number two were Accelerator number one and Hang Time number two, just like me. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if he liked Ghost Rider or Silver Bullet more is what I'm not sure. So... You'll have to ask him. Yeah. So, but he definitely, he he enjoyed uh, Accelerator the most. So, we both, both agreed on that. So, let's see. Um, opened in 2002. It actually just had its 20th birthday this week. Wow. Which is kind of cool. Shares so a birthday with me. Pretty close. So, so your birthday is on the 25th. Its birthday uh, was on the 22nd. So, yep. So, it had its 20th birthday. Um, it debuted in 2002. It debuted at number 35 in the Golden Ticket Awards. And stayed in the top 50 until 2010. Uh, in the Coaster Bot rankings, it currently ranks number 40 in the country. Okay. So pretty pretty decent ranking. Puts it, yeah, puts it below coasters such as Top Thrill Dragster at Cedar Point. It is behind Storm Runner at Hershey Park. And also Haggard's Motorbike Adventure at Universal. It ranks above coasters such as Copperhead Strike at Carowinds. King Daka at Six Flags Great Adventure and Max Force at Six Flags Great America. So those are all of those are launch coasters. So just to kind of compare it with some of the other popular launch coasters within the country. So mm. um, in the coaster bot rankings, it ranks second. So the um, Ghost Rider is ranked at number twenty-two, and Accelerator at number forty. And for me, like Ghost Rider, it, it really just depends on what your preferences are. For me, I I don't like wooden coasters as much as the average enthusiast, I think. I don't not like them, but I think yeah. I just, I don't enjoy them as much as other people. And Ghost Rider also focuses a lot on laterals. So, like, high-speed turns without a lot of banking. So, it's kind of like whipping, whipping you. you to the side. Oh, I wouldn't like that. So, in, <laughs> and like um, Thunderbolt at Kennywood does that too. Um, during the kind of that mid course section where it goes like around a couple times. Yeah. In fact, the the laterals on Thunderbolt are so high that they actually make sure that um, one, you have to be sitting next to somebody. You can't sit by yourself on Thunderbolt. And two, they the bigger person has to be on the outside. I think, if I remember correctly. Because so, is it just like a? There's no individual seating. It's a. I think I think that's what it was. Because Ghost Rider has individual seats and individual lap bars, so it doesn't really matter. But with Thunderbolt, I think it's a. It must just be a bench with, a, like, with a buzz bar or something, which would make it so that you're sliding around and. Would, and Thunderbolt is that not right? No, Thunder Thunderbolt at Kennywood. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, there's <laughs> was no like, Thunderbolt no. at Kennywood. 
Sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm talking confused. about. Yeah. So Thunderbolt at Kennywood is the same way, just really fat, really high lateral forces. So, which isn't my cup of tea, which is why I liked Accelerator and Hang Time better. Um, so the rest of the rankings are Silver Bullet at 120, Hang Time 122, then Montezuma's Revenge, Sierra Sidewinder, Pony Express, Jaguar, and Coast Rider. So. Nice. Yep, so that is kind of our introduction. So now let's go back to 1975. All right, 1975. So, <laughs> while we're while we're pausing to let the the clock to the time machine take us back in time, that Haley was dancing to the. <laughs> In, in in real time, we don't actually have the clock ticking. That's added in afterwards when I'm editing. So she was just dancing to, just to being empty adored. space. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> don't need to apologize. So Knott's Berry Farm, 1975. We're, in, we're starting at Knott's Berry Farm. We're pretty much going to spend the whole time at Knott's Berry Farm. So at this point, Park had been operating for about 35 years and was just starting to enter the market as a major amusement park. So... The park had started adding attractions and rides in the 50s, but had only started charging admission in 1968. So up until that point, the rides were just kind of there to entertain people while they waited for their table at the oh, at the cool. restaurant. That's how the park got started. It was just the line for the restaurant was so long, like hours. Huh. And so they were adding things to like keep people entertained in the meantime. And then... Finally, in 1968, they kind of separated and said, okay, we're going to have the restaurant over here, and let's, and we're going to have this be like a separate ticketed amusement park over here. And that, that was kind of how it started. Um, since Disneyland is only 10 minutes away, the park had struggled to gain national attention for their attractions. Um, the farm was extremely popular for the boysenberry and the diner, but the amusement industry in Southern California is extremely competitive. With Disneyland, Six Flags Magic Mountain. Oh, there's tons. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. Legoland. There. There's yeah. Uni- there's... Universal Hollywood is yeah. over there. So all kinds of stuff in Southern California. So, but in 1975, Knott's was going to make a huge addition to the park that would not only put them like on the map as far as the amusement industry is concerned, but it would change the industry forever. So in 1975... Corkscrew opened to the public and was the first steel coaster to go upside down ever and was constructed by Aerodynamics. The 1200 foot or 1250 foot coaster was 70 feet tall, had a top speed of 46 miles per hour. Um, ride was really simple. It had a drop, a bank turn, then it went through two corkscrews and a bank turn back into the station. Huh. And that was the whole ride. So super <laughs> simple. But the, the, for a ride to a roller coaster to go upside down was completely unheard of. Never had been done. So there had been wooden coasters that went upside down like in the early 1900s. But they were super dangerous. And the, so people kept getting hurt on them. So like upside down coasters would like, they, they just stopped doing it because it was so dangerous. But huh. Then in 1975, Aerodynamics was like, no, we can we can do this and make it safe. And they did. And it, cool. it changed everything. So there were a couple of this model that opened that year, but this was the first one to open. So Knott's Berry Farm claims, has the lakes claim to the record of the first steel coaster to go upside down, which is cool. Which and it was their first roller coaster ever at the park. Ah. So this was a big deal. Um so, also, it only cost seven hundred thousand dollars. That's not bad. That's not a lot of money for, I mean, for a roller coaster. With the so. housing market the way it is right now, you could buy a house with mm-hmm. that. Uh, definitely. <laughs> this was also almost fifty years ago at this yeah, point, I but bet it's all, the net worth has increased. Yeah, the inflation definitely you know would change that number, <laughs> but still, not a lot for you know what this coaster meant to the industry. So, a year later, so like I said, this puts the park on the map, and they're like, extremely successful um, investment in the park, and so they're going to continue to keep adding things. So, a year later, the park worked with Aerodynamics to construct their second coaster. The coaster was Cycle Chase, another completely new coaster model in the industry. 
Um, it was known as a steeplechase coaster, which is similar to a typical racing coaster. Okay. But instead of two tracks side by side, it was three. four. Oh, I was going to say. Yep, so you can see one, That's two, three, four. Yeah, it's kind of they're old pictures. but So and these were the vehicles that you were on. They were just oh like gosh. these old motorcycles you that you sat on. Here's your first Tron Roller <laughs> I mean, really, I, that's a good point. I didn't look to see if this was the first time that you like sat on like a motorcycle type vehicle, but definitely, I'm sure it has to be, if not the first time, one of the first times that this type of vehicle um, was on a coaster. Um, with the top, see? general public's got some knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. There you go. See, I'm the fun one. You're I the gotta... fun one. <laughs> You may not have your facts straight, but you uh, <laughs> you, you do add some fun. Ain't that the truth, though. Mm-hmm. So, with a top speed of 40 miles per hour, the attraction was tamer than Corkscrew, but still featured a completely unique experience. And Aerodynamics only ever constructed two of these. This So, they constructed this one at Knott's Berry Farm, and then another one at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, which is in uh, England. Okay. So... Uh, over the next four years, Knott's continued to be, continued to build new attractions and coasters. In 1978, they opened Montezuma's Revenge, which was a state-of-the-art uh, launch coaster, which we've actually talked about before because it was the same as Laser Loop that was at Kennywood, which is what uh, got replaced by Phantom's Revenge. Ah. So, but Knott's Berry Farm also built one of those, and that one is still at the park today. Really? Yep. So, um. So with two major thrill coasters in the park now, um, Cycle Chase had been having some issues where the vehicles were a little bit too top heavy. So the, like those motorcycle style vehicles that you saw, and like the track wasn't banked at all. So like they like people were like kind of tipping over too much on the top. Yeah, that's a little scary. That's terrifying. <laughs> so um, hey, let so me just tip you over, man. Yeah, just fall right off. So the decision had been made to overhaul Cycle Chase for the 1980 season. So they replaced the motor style or the motorcycle style cars with like soapbox derby style cars, hmm. and reduced the speed from 40 to 30 miles per hour. It's a big speed reducer. Yeah. So the coaster was renamed Wacky Soapbox Racers, and okay, um, <laughs> that's like I don't know from marketing standpoint i wouldn't want to get on something called wacky soapbox racers why not what's wrong with that name wacky soapbox racers i don't know i don't know maybe i'm just weird (laughs) i'm not the fun one here you you just said you were the fun one (laughs) anyway this is like an artist rendition of the ride um before it opened which i like the Um, artist rendition mm -hmm. but well, and it was pretty cool because, so, like I said, they're a theme park, right? So, they, right. They, don't, they try to have every ride has a theme. So, this one, you would, like, go on the track and there would be parts of the ride where there's, like, a door in front of you. And the coaster would actually hit the door and it would, like, smash open. Um, and then there was a part where there was, like, firework effects. Like, you went through a shed where there was, like fireworks going off and exploding so like it, actual fireworks? no I, and but that was like the special effect that they that's had that's so cool so a lot of people described it as like being in like a cartoon of like like if you were watching like some huh. animated cartoon of like a soapbox race yeah. this is almost like they throw you into like that with like huh. really like um off the wall animations dramatic, and yeah. dramatic explosions cool. and smashing through doors and so and all 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 of that while you're racing side by side with three other cars huh. so it was with when they reduced the speed this really made this more of a family attraction right right so you have your two big thrill coasters and now this is kind of your family coaster so is this still there or no we'll talk about it we'll get okay. there we'll get there Gosh. are you trying to skip ahead i you told me to ask questions. That was me oh, asking you're fine. questions. You're fine. Keep asking questions. That's good. Well, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> well, it's going to be a spoiler if I give you an answer. <laughs> You'll find out. Okay. So the coaster operated without issues for an additional 16 years. And during that time, they didn't really add any other coasters, but they did keep, they were still adding things. So they added Camp Snoopy in 1983 and the River Rapids Ride in 1988. 
1990, the park sold cork corkscrew to another park to make room for a boomerang um, coaster, which was their first new major coaster since Montezuma's Revenge. Uh, corkscrew still operates to this day in Idaho, of all places. And Coeur so. Yeah, it's like up in the Coeur d'Alene area. There's a park up there called Silverwood. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I know about Silverwood. Yep, and so... Never been there, but... Yeah, so... But yeah, this is... So, I mean, this is a modern-day picture. This is Corkscrew uh, nowadays at Silverwood. So, it is interesting. The first coaster to go upside down still is operating, but not at the park that built it. That's interesting. So, it is kind of interesting. I really so. like that design, though. Like, the supports. The supports look really good. And a lot of the coasters that Aerodynamics did with the corkscrew design featured kind of that structure. To, it was really aesthetically pleasing. In fact, when we go to Cedar Point, they have a model like oh, this really? that also has that support structure. So we'll get to see one later this year. That's cool. So let's see. Uh, corkscrew still operates to this day. And then in 1995, Knott's Berry Farm opened another family coaster, and this is Jaguar. So it was a custom coaster built by Zier. And in the years leading up to this, um, wacky soapbox racers had been experiencing more and more technical difficulties. Some of the special effects were no longer working properly. Um, so in 1996, the park announced that wacky soapbox racers would be removed for a new attraction. So, so and it's not, there. it's not there anymore. It's not there anymore. So oh, darn wacky soapbox racers. <laughs> so this to me, it I kind do, of... I do like this, uh, the, the train on this, like the, the detail in it is pretty cool. So, and this is the, um, when I talked about the, the Fiesta village, which has like the, the Aztec and Mayan theming. This is the one that kind of, that's like the, the main attraction of oh, that okay. area. Well, and Montezuma's Revenge, which is also themed to that. So, but this one's not super thrilling, but I mean, you know, it does work as a family coaster. So I think when they built this, that kind of gave them the option to get rid of wacky soapbox racers. And this could kind of step into that spot. The problem was, is, people had really fallen in love with Wacky Soapbox Racers. They had been at the park for 20 years. Yeah. In fact, when I went, um, so my, both of my parents are from Southern California, and when I went and was, like, sending pictures from my, my, my trip, my mom asked me if Wacky Soapbox Racers was still there. because she. Remember do you remember that? Because she, she remembered that. That was a that ride was that a she had gone on when she was a kid. And so she was sad when she found out it wasn't there anymore. Yeah. And people still talk about it all the time. In fact, when you go into the gift shops, they still have wacky soapbox racer t-shirts and really? hats and stuff. Because it's just such a historical part of the park. Do you think they park. would ever bring it back? I don't think so. Probably uh, the biggest problem, like I've said, landlocked, is yeah. that Knott's is landlocked. So what did it? What was it replaced with? Sorry, jumping ahead. <laughs> I'll stop now. We'll talk. Give, give me two minutes, and we'll talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> We're almost there. So they never really. The park never really gave an explanation why the ride was removed. The rumor is that management was more interested in adding thrill rides to keep up with Six Flags Magic Mountain. Because the, the, the dichotomy between some of these parks in Southern California was that Disney is the family park, right? And then Six Flags Magic Mountain was like the thrill park. That's like where the teenagers went for, for all the extreme roller coasters. And Knott's kind of fell into like this middle ground where they like wanted to have some family stuff, but also some thrill stuff so that they could kind of try to appeal to both audiences. Which is smart. Yeah, it is smart. So um, so I think the idea was is they wanted to keep adding thrill rides to keep up with Six Flags Magic Mountain um, since they already had a decent amount of family stuff for to compete with Disneyland. Anyway, the other prevalent rumor is that the coaster track was wearing out and would need to be completely replaced to keep the ride, the ride operational. Which, in that case, is usually just as expensive as building a brand new ride. So, sometimes parks are willing to do that. Like, Universal did that with the Incredible Hulk coaster a few years ago. Where they basically, they retracked the entire ride. Hmm. As opposed to building a new ride, that was what they decided to do. So that they could keep that ride there. 
So that does happen where, you know, they have to put in the money to, to keep these rides around a long time. So regardless, the decision was made to remove wacky, wacky soapbox racers. Many guests were, you know, livid with the decision. Um, so park much park management knew that they really had to put in something that was going to, you know, you know, it was going to be a worthy replacement of this legendary attraction. So in September of 1996, the park officially announced uh, Windjammer Surf Racers, a $9 million steel looping and racing coaster uh, that was going to be built by, according to the article I read, it was going to be built by Italian manufacturer Zamperla, but um, never ended up, it, it was built by some other company. So and I, at some point that, that changed, but anyway, park officials recognized how upset guests were. So they wanted to build another racing coaster to kind of, you know, in the spirit of wacky soapbox racers, they wanted to build another racing coaster, but something much more thrilling. Mm -hmm. They had wanted to kind of update the theming of that area too. So they mm -hmm. kind of, they were talking about a space theme and then they moved into maybe like an aviation theme. And then one of the later ideas was like an underwater, like Atlantis theme. Finally, what they settled on was like a boardwalk beach type of theme. So you can see this is obviously themed to surfing. And um, they built like um, like a little lagoon underneath the coaster. And then like some of the other rides were themed to other boardwalk and surfing themes. That's really cool. That's yeah. Such a cool theme. Mm -hmm. So it looks really good. I also found this uh, picture which shows some of the concept art as they were looking to design the, the vehicles for the coaster. Oh, cool. Which I haven't seen this before on like another, another ride where it's just kind of cool to see the process of like... Not only are they designing the coaster, but they're designing the outside. But they're and then you know even to things that such as they're designing what the actual trains, trains are going to look yeah. like. So this is pretty cool. So this is the one they eventually settled on was the with the surfboards running down the side. Um, yeah, so I really like the little doors on that though. Yeah, these are pretty cool. On designs, the yellow ones, so. what's it designed after? I, this one almost looks like a space theme, right? So I don't know if maybe that, that was. Because that one early. looks like more. Oops, sorry. That one looks okay. like more like a space theme too. Yeah, so I I don't know exactly um, what the what the themes were. You know, the, obviously, you know, this is the surfing theme that they eventually went with. But uh, yeah, these all look really good, though. They, mm. they look really cool. This one's almost like a steampunk theme, kind yeah. of. Yeah. But so, it has like a little laser thingy. Yeah, yeah. So this one kind of strikes me as like a 50s hot rod type of mm -hmm. thing. So clearly there were different ideas going around as they were you know, developing the, the um, you know, the, the how to build the coaster. So, yeah. So this is cool. I like the, the as they were designing the coaster train. So, and then here's, here's a few more pictures of the ride once it was completed. So. We'll talk a little bit more about the ride. Um, I did find this one article, which was kind of funny. At this at this point, um, Six Flags Magic Mountain was building... Oh, what did they call it at the time? I think... I can't remember if they changed the name. Nowadays, it's called Superman Escape from Krypton, which basically, it just shoots you... Um, I think they've changed it now. It's, I think you launch backwards nowadays. But when they first opened, you launched out of the station at 100 miles an hour... And then you go up a spike that's like 300 feet tall, and then you would fall backwards oh, and no. right back into the station. Oh, no. Why, <laughs> you wouldn't do that? Well, why not? It goes backwards. And at that f speed, like, I like Everest because I like the theming and stuff, so it doesn't bother yeah. me. So, well, okay. <laughs> I guess I won't be able to get you on... Well, I knew I wouldn't be able to get you on Mr. Freeze Reverse Blast because that one launches backwards, but... um. So. You think so? Well, you just said you wouldn't go on... <laughs> this one that... You just said you wouldn't go on this one that launches backwards, so why would you go on the other one that launches backwards? Because I, <laughs> I want to. I don't, I don't <laughs> understand your reasoning here. I'm the general public. I don't have to have a reasoning. Oh, is that how this works? <laughs> you can just say whatever you I want. I do what I want. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. I'm getting, getting tired. <laughs> Six, Six 
Butterflies Magic Mountain was building Escape from Krypton at the same time. Oh, I've, I've got it here. It's, it was called Superman the Escape at the time. So, but they were talking about how Knott's Berry Farm was building this ride. And they said, you know, maybe it was kind of, you know, to compete with this new ride they're building at Magic Mountain. And this this quote just made, made me laugh. Uh, this guy was talking about Superman the Escape at Magic Mountain. Well, we should be talking only about rides that actually work. Because <laughs> at that point, uh, Superman the Escape had been having lots of technical difficulties. Really? Didn't open when it was supposed to, so... At the time that they're opening this, Magic Bounce also having problems with their new ride. So it's kind of interesting. I just like that quote. It's like, well, we should only be talking about rides that actually work. I mean, work. hey. He's not wrong. Well, unfortunately, this ride didn't work either. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get into I that. keep jumping ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. So Windjammer would feature two racing tracks, a red one and a yellow one, with an inversion on each track and sprawling layout of dips and bank turns. Um, coaster was designed with high capacity in mind, able to run 10 trains between the two tracks. So five trains on each track. Wow. So kind of like last week or last episode, we talked about Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket, where it has like small trains, but it's able to run a lot of them or like Space Mountain, same concept. Yeah. Space Mountain, I should say uh, Space Mountain at Disney World, I, eh, maybe Disneyland too, I guess. But so the ride seemed to be like a great success and was a hit among enthusiasts in the GP initially. However, things quickly became disastrous for Knott's. So shortly after opening, guests were already starting to complain about significant headbanging and a rough ride experience. Uh, The complaints became so prevalent that Knott's hired engineers to inspect the coaster and make sure everything was working properly. Uh, Engineers determined that parts of the coaster track were misaligned, which which was causing excessive roughness. Not only that, but the misalignment was beginning to take its toll on the track, and parts of the structure were showing wear and tear typically not seen for years. And it had only been like a couple weeks. Oh, no. So, not good. That's really not good. Yeah. I wouldn't want to go on it. No, thank you. So, and then worst of all, the coaster had become prone to valleying towards the end of the ride. You remember what that means? Basically, it just means the coaster gets stuck. Like it's not, oh, it's it like right. when it goes up a hill, but then it like rolls back, it gets stuck in like the, the bottom of two drops or whatever. That's what valleying so means. how do they evacuate that kind of thing? Uh, so there's a couple different ways. Sometimes they have to do it with a crane. Um, sometimes coasters will have like a special car that they can put on the track that can like actually go and push the the, 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 tra- the train back to the station. Um, it just depends on the on the train and the ride, how they're able to do it. Sometimes if a ride is really prone to valleying in a certain spot, they'll put a platform on that part of the track. So that way, if it happens, all they have to do is get the people out and they can walk down some stairs to get off the ride. So it just depends on the ride. So Could you imagine that happening and having to go on a crane to get off the ride? Yeah. So no I, yeah, that does not sound fun. Also, like that's like one of my worst fears is getting stuck on a ride for hours, no sunscreen. I would die. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting dehydrated. Well, that's when they they give you a fast pass for everything else that for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. I think. Being your your wife at, of a roller coaster enthusiast like, who likes to ride everything, like that's like my biggest fear, is just getting stuck because yeah. I've heard of it's happening so much of like people getting stuck. The thing is, is you hear about it every time it happens, but if you think about it, coasters run hundreds of times a day. Yeah, and it typically only happens on each coaster. I don't know. Usually, usually doesn't happen ever in a season. But may happen once or twice. And, and it depends on the ride. Some are more well, prone to valleying than others. Like even when we went, oh, I can't remember if it was King's Dominion or King's Island, but they got stuck on the drop tower for like 30 minutes. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, that's like one of my biggest fears is just getting stuck and just, you can't go anywhere. Like, you're just yeah. stuck there. Yeah. And it's like, oh my goodness. Yeah, no, thank you. We're getting stuck upside down. I've heard of that happening too. See, that doesn't happen as often as people make it sound like. There's there's a lot of clickbait. Yeah. Like, 
there, there's this, I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but there's this one company that has become notorious among the enthusiasts for always having clickbait articles. Mm. It's like coaster gets stuck upside down for three hours and you click on the article and it's like, Older it's a, it's a, well, it's a roller coaster that goes upside down and it got stuck in one spot for like 20 minutes. And you're like, how do you, like, you're completely lying in the title of your article, but you know, it's really dumb. Just crabs people's attention. Exactly. Well, and it convinces people to click on it and then it's wrong, mm-hmm. but you know, they don't care about that. They just care that you clicked and got them some ad revenue, right? So anyway. It's frustrating. So really doesn't happen as often as people say. But this ride was prone to, to having some valeting issues. And when engineers were looking into why it was happening, they determined the cause was the wind. <laughs> Which is really unfortunate for a ride named Wind Windjammer. That's really funny. This ride was literally being jammed by the wind, and it's called Windjammer. That's gold. That's, that's really that's really that's un- pretty funny. That's really unfortunate. <laughs> so, and sometimes wind can be and like wind can be a problem I, yeah, for coasters. Like, like you know, that's not uncommon. But wind gusts as low as three miles per hour could cause the train to stall. Oh my! So goodness. this left the park with no other choice than to close the ride during windy conditions. For a ride with wind in the name. That's horrible. So bad. The marketing team must have been just, <laughs> just face palming. Just can't, can't believe this. I'm face palming for them. Like That's ter- I feel so bad for the marketing people. So, uh, so I mean, they they jinx themselves, man. I guess so. What so. should we name this? Wind jammer. Wind jammer. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but that's Apparently, unfortunate. Apparently, it was perfect. Yeah, so. yeah. I think Windjammer might be like a type of, um, not surfing, but like, um, oh, what's the parasailing? Is that what I'm thinking of? I don't know. When when it's like you're on a it's like you're on a surfboard, but you have a sail. Is that parasailing? I don't know. I don't live on a beach. I don't know these terms. So anyway. As all this was going on, the Knott family had been considering selling Knott's Berry Farm. So they put it up for sale in 1997, and initially Disney had offered to purchase the park. Really? Mm-hmm. So they, at this time, they, they had plans to build a park in the D.C. area that was going to be called Disney's America. And the plans for that fell through and never were, never happened. So that had been happening the years previous to this. And then when Knott's went for sale, Disney offered to buy Knott's Berry Farm, and they wanted to, so these are these are the initial plans for Disney America. And they were going to kind of take the Disney America idea and make it fit within Knott's Berry Farm instead. And it would basically be An Disney, addition. yeah, it would be Disneyland's second gate. Because this was before California, uh, California Adventure had been built. Right. Um, however, when plans were shown to the Knott family, they were concerned that Disney would completely overhaul the park and leave nothing behind of their parents' legacy. Because both of both of the original Knotts, uh, the Knott parents that had founded it, they had both passed away by this point. So this is this is the children that are in charge of this now. Got it. So they decided to decline Disney's offer, and later that year, Cedar Fair offered to purchase the park. And eventually did so for two hundred and forty-five million dollars in late nineteen ninety-seven. So after that happened, Cedar Fair immediately replaced the park's manager, who had been responsible for the removal of Corkscrew and the Wacky Soapbox Racers. And it seemed like that park manager was kind of like in with the old and out, or, or out with the old and in with the new, right? When I think some people would have preferred if they kept the old stuff that was like legendary and like. Like, imagine if Wacky Soapbox Racers was still there. I think they could have refurbished it, and it would still be an, an you know, I mean, an e-ticket attraction you know, if there. if your mom talked about it, then it must have been, like... Right? And, like, people have been going to Knott's forever. I mean, and so like how you're... Kennywood is with uh, the kangaroo. The... Mm-hmm. I... Like, there's, there's, there's stuff way more technologically advanced than the kangaroo. But mm-hmm. people don't want that. People want the stuff that's been there forever. Mm-hmm. And, like, if you think about... Uh, think about Space Mountain at Disney World. Oh, they could build if they tore out Space Mountain and built a brand new attraction there. They could 
blow Space Mountain out of the water with the uh, technology that they could they could put in that space. It's but they'll magic. never do it. Yeah, it's they'll really never do it because people love the old attraction. So I think it was a mistake to remove Wacky Soapbox Racers. I think they should have kept it. But so and I think Cedar Fair felt that way too. So they wanted to put in somebody from that uh, somebody that worked in the Cedar Fair chain. They put them in as the new park manager. Shortly thereafter, the yellow track on Windjammer started experiencing significant technical difficulties. The ride remained open, but without the racing feature. So now, not only is it having issues, but now it's lost some of its appeal because it doesn't even race like it's supposed to. Um, eventually, the yellow track was deemed unrideable and completely closed and just sat there standing but not operating. In fact, it it ran so uh it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Infrequently. Infrequently, that there's it's hard to find pictures and videos of the yellow track actually running. That's so insane. like if you pull up videos and pictures of it, it's so like red track. like this one, yes, the yellow track is running, but this is probably from within the first couple months because this is a Knott's Berry Farm advertisement, right? Right. But like, yeah, if you pull up other videos, um, yeah, it's hard to find video of the yellow track oh operating. My gosh. So <clears throat> I'm very curious how does this all tie in to to accelerator? Yeah. Uh, well, we'll get there. <laughs> I keep jumping. Ahead. You're like, I want to go to bed. No. Let's finish this. No, I want to know. It's cool. I'm keeping you on the edge of your seat. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. So the 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 manufacturer that had built this attraction, their name is Togo. And they're a Japanese manufacturer. And in Japan, they're really popular. Like, they're the probably the number one manufacturer of coasters in the Japan area. Okay. But they had just kind of just started getting into the U.S. market. I think this was like their third or fourth coaster that they built in the U.S. Okay. And this attraction, along with some of the other ones they built, were starting to develop a reputation of being rough and having issues so it wasn't good. Like this attraction and some of the other ones were having issues all at the same time. So their reputation was starting to falter. Um, the park continued to dump money into the addressing issues with the red track. They even took out some portions of the track, put new portions in to try to smooth the ride. And it seemed to do little to alleviate the issues. It was better, but not by much. Um, in 1998, um, Knott's Berry Farm added Ghost Rider, which was a massive wooden coaster built by CCI. And the new addition was a huge success and helped to relieve some of the issues Windjammer had caused. Specifically, now their headline attraction is actually operating. Because <laughs> that's the worst part about this, right? Yeah. Is when you build a brand new ride to try to bring people to the park and then it's not even working properly, like no one wants to come back. So to get, like, now your headline attraction is working properly, so now people are coming to the park for Ghost Rider and not for your broken Windjammer coaster. So that helps. The park starts to do a little better now I mean, that Ghost Rider's... Do not want to go for the Boysenberries? Well, I mean, people still want to go for the Boysenberries, but uh, the coaster enthusiasts were definitely <laughs> there for, for Windjammer. The public wants to go the for GP the... wanted the Boysenberries. Give me them Boysenberries. <laughs> So, over the next few years, the park did everything they could to keep Windjammer running, though its popularity, popularity had dwindled significantly. Um, and that this is an interesting story. So, in 2000, Knott's hosted an event for coaster enthusiasts with, like, a behind-the-scenes tour and stuff. I don't know if it was Ace or some other group, but they did a behind-the-scenes tour of Windjammer. Um, they weren't able to ride it that day. But they did get to, like, get a tour and talk with the manager. During the tour, the park manager was very blunt with the enthusiast and basically said the ride's feature did not look good. Um, it was hindering development of that section of the park. Um, he wanted it gone. He literally said that. He told them, he's like, I want it out of my park. Uh, but there were negotiations with Togo that were still ongoing to, like, can we get this resolved? Can we get this fixed? Hmm. 11 days later, Knott's filed a lawsuit with the manufacturer of the roller coaster. Oh, shots fired. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> they filed for $16 million in Ow. damages. 
and their claims included that Togo had delivered a ride that was laden with problems and had not honored warranties in the contract, leaving Knotts to pay for $2 million in repairs over the course of the three years. That no, the I don't blame them for suing. I mean, that's a lot of revenue lost. So. Mm-hmm. so, the ride was immediately closed and submitted as evidence for the case. So, that happens in 2000. And for this is going on for a year. The case still hasn't gone to court yet. You know, they're doing all the legal procedures and everything. It takes takes so long to to get these things happening. So in March of 2001, Togo actually filed for bankruptcy. So this combined with all the other rides that they had built that were having issues. I mean, their reputation was just ruined. And so they filed for bankruptcy just in the U.S. So the company still actually does things in In Japan Japan, to this day. But their U.S. office completely shut down. Um, Nothing had come of the lawsuit yet, but um, Knott's continued. They said, like, no, we're not dropping the lawsuit just because they went bankrupt. Like, because they knew they knew they still had a parent company in Japan that could pay the 16 million. Right. Right. So they're going to keep doing this. As the case was still waiting, Knotts was continuing to lose business as they were unable to utilize that part of the park for, you know, any potential development. So Knotts finally had had enough, and before the lawsuit had even gone to court, they tore down Windjammer, the Lagoon, all the other rides in that area, and any references to surfing of any kind. Like, they were just so sick of it. That they just, like the, the park manager said, he's like, I want it gone. I want it out of my park. And oh, so wow. they didn't sell the ride. They just, they just tore it down, sold it for scrap. Just get this out of my park. Wow. <laughs> I'll meet this guy. <laughs> yeah, he was very blunt about it. I like so, it. Um, to this day, it is notorious for being one of the worst failed coasters of all time. Only operated for three years from opening to closing down and tearing it down crazy so and the reason we're talking about it is because in december of 2001 knots announced accelerator a 13 million dollar hydraulic launch coaster from intamin that would go in the spot where windjammer once stood and where the wacky soapbox racers had once stood before that so a lot of history just in this one little spot of the park where accelerator sits to this day so Coaster would go from 0 to 82 miles per hour in 2.3 seconds and stand at 205 feet tall. Coaster would also be the first to feature a hydraulic launch. So, you ready for some coaster science? (laughs) We're going to talk about hydraulic launches. All right, let's go. Okay, so hydraulic launch systems utilize a catch car, which is called a sled, which connects to a cable that latches on to a mechanism on the underside of the coaster train to pull it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to dumb this down because there's a lot here, (laughs) but basically the way it works is um, hydraulic fluid is pumped into several different hydraulic accumulators um, like these, these ones here. And as the incompressible hydraulic fluid is pumped into one compartment right here, there's nitrogen in the other half of the tank, which nitrogen can be compressed. So the nitrogen is compressed by all the hydraulic fluid that's being pumped into the tank. And then once the nitrogen is compressed to an extremely high pressure, the pumping stops and the nitrogen goes into a cylinder block, which is this portion down here. Okay. And then when the coaster launches, the fluid under pressure from the accumulators is used to drive, uh, I was either 16 or 32 hydraulic motors. Um, basically, to simplify it, all the pressure is released from the hydraulic fluid, you know, putting all that pressure onto the nitrogen. And then once released, this um, section here basically winds, the, the way it was described as like a fishing rod, mm. like when you're winding up a fishing rod and you're reeling in the, the, the fishing line. Same concept is it basically it's reeling in that cable that's attached to the coaster car it just pulls it. It's almost like, um, so our, our Walmart here in Pea Ridge has something called zip line. And that's like a drone base. Mm-hmm. And they do the same thing. Pull it back with the, the string and then 
They don't. I don't see them reel it in, but they catch it on that same string. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That one may just be using the force of like pulling it back and letting go. I guess I'm just trying to understand. Mm-hmm. So basically, this is the same concept though. Is like it's just using the nitrogen uh, or the pressure built from compressing the nitrogen to quickly pull the the catch car which is attached to the train and then as the catch car gets back to this point it stops and then the train just keeps going so all right yep i'm not a, i'm not an engineer so i don't know all the the ins and outs of it but do you think people come be like engineers just to like design roller coasters oh absolutely roller coasters like people will definitely become engineers to be specifically a roller coaster engineer that's sweet mm-hmm. in fact um our, our friend Cody, he when he was in high school, he actually wanted to be a roller coaster engineer. Of that course was, he did. That was like his dream job when he was in high school. There you go, school, Cody. So. That's our shout out to you. Yeah. So he ended up going into sociology instead. So, <laughs> <laughs> so different. So complete, which, I mean, that's what happens. I wanted to be a musician when I was in high school, and now I work in retail. As, you know, I work in the, in the business world. So you never know. <laughs> Life changes. Yeah. So. So anyway, this was revolutionary technology. You know, launch coasters had been a thing, but mostly at this point had utilized magnets, which um, like Flight of Fear and um, what's uh, another Skyrocket example? Uses um, mag- yeah, and magnets are still used today, but um, hydraulics um, allowed it to be a much more intense and fast launch. Um, and eventually, this same technology was used by SNS to create an air launch like powder keg so it's the same concept but they're compressing air instead of using hydraulic fluid and nitrogen hmm. so same concept but a little bit different a little more economically friendly as we talked about more, in the first episode greener. yep which is what we talked about with powder keg in the first episode right so mm-hmm. but this was before that technology was invented so this hydraulic launch was completely revolutionary and at the time that accelerator opened it was the fastest accelerating roller coaster in the world so yeah. it was it was it was groundbreaking. There you go. There, that's yep. one way to get on the map. Exactly. So it was scheduled to open in May 2002. Construction was delayed slightly, but not too much, as it opened to the public on June 22nd, 2002, and continues to operate to this day. So the ride experience is as follows: guests board 20 seat trains in rows of two, five cars per train. Once lap bars have been checked, a stoplight at the front of the station begins to count down. Riders are then launched from 0 to 82 miles per hour in 2.3 seconds. At the end of the launch track, the train hits a vertical track up into a 205-foot top hat. After cresting the top hat, riders dive back down a vertical drop before ascending into a 110-foot tall bank turn to the left. The train dives back down to ground level before climbing into a 90-foot tall bank turn to the right and then speed into the final brakes. From launch to final breaks is about 22 seconds. So it's a fairly short ride, which, I mean, Storm Runner, if you think about Storm Runner, also fairly short. Storm Runner is a little bit longer. I think Storm Runner is like 37 seconds, something like that. Um, but, I mean, launch coasters tend to be shorter rides than mm-hmm. typical, you know, chain lift coasters right. anyway. So, um, But, you know, this one, this ride is all about the sheer intensity of the launch. So I found this quote from a newspaper that I, I hated. I just, I hate the way he describes this. So he, when he was talking was... about, he, when he was talking about the launch coaster and how intense the launch was, he said, it puts your eyeballs in your ears. <laughs> <That's> just... <laughs> Where do you find these newspapers? <laughs> I just, I go, well, I use newspapers.com and I'm just, I'm searching for articles just to see what people's reactions to the rides are and see if there's any details I can get that aren't just. Oh, you find um, the details. Oh, I found like, tons of weird stuff. It puts your eyeballs in your ears. I hate that. That's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I don't, well, the, th- I'm gonna the use thing that is that like, well, I'm just... put your eyeballs in your ears. <laughs> Like, when I'm on a launch coaster, I don't feel anything up here. I, you know, I feel the, the punch in your gut as, yeah. you, as you, know, you take off and you feel like you you nope. leave, you know, nope, leave everything put behind. Put your eyeballs. Put your eyeballs in your ears. <laughs> I hate that. That's horrible. <laughs> oh, oh, 
Yeah. So the ride was a smash hit among enthusiasts and the GP alike. At the time, like I mentioned, it was the fastest accelerating coaster in the world. And even to this day is still the seventh fast accelerating coaster in the world 20 years later. Wow. So uh, still revolutionary for, for its day. In 2003, Windjammer's lawsuit finally went to trial. So you know, almost a year, a year after the, this attraction had replaced it. After five weeks of presenting evidence, the jury only took five hours to deliberate and excuse Togo from any prosecution. <laughs> Which is crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> so, Knott's lawyers argued the jury failed to properly examine over a hundred pieces of submitted evidence, while Togo's lawyers praised the, the outcome, claiming Knott's was just looking for a way to pay for Accelerator. Oh my gosh. Pretty crazy. So, But regardless of the outcome, I mean... Togo's reputation had already been ruined by this point. The The real problem was, you know, Knott's had lost out on a lot of money from this whole ordeal. So, uh, in the years that followed, Accelerator helped Knott's recover from the financial disaster that Windjammer was. And the park would continue to add new coasters over the next 20 years, including Silver Bullet and Hang Time. Um, which, interesting enough, Hang Time is another surfing-themed coaster, um, so I guess eventually they were like, okay, I guess we can bring the surfing thing back. You know, now, now the Windjammer's been gone for a it's while. It's a good theme. So <laughs> it is a good theme. It's and like, funny. Well, and this, and Hang Time's in that boardwalk section with Accelerator. So, I mean, it makes sense to, to right. have a surfing theme in that mm-hmm. area. So, uh, let's see. Accelerator also paved the way for a boom in hydraulic launched coasters all, all across the world over the next several years. So in 2003... Cedar Point would open Top Thrill Dragster, which would be the fir- the world's first roller coaster to go over 400 feet tall. So it uses the same technology, same it's the same model as Accelerator and Storm Runner, but just cranks the cranks the top speed up to 11. So instead of being a 200 foot Is, tall, will this be the tallest one that I got on? Well, this one's closed right now. Um, this is the one that had an issue last year, and so it's closed for the remainder of 2022. And people are actually kind of iffy on if it's ever going to open again. So, Interesting. Yeah. The, the one thing that these hydraulic coasters are crazy intense and crazy popular, they have been notorious for having maintenance issues. Mm. And typically at whatever park that they are at, they are the coaster that has the most downtime of everything else that's at their parks. So they are really popular. People love how intense they are, but they do tend to have a lot of downtime, a lot of maintenance issues. So that is the one downside to this. And Accelerator is not an exception to that. Accelerator has had issues uh, that we will talk about. <laughs> so, but still, uh, you know, still a headline attraction at the park. And none of these have had severe issues it's more just like you, you get in line for the ride it's got an hour long rate and then you get to the front of the line and it has a problem it has to shut down like that tends to happen a lot so people pretty much always say if you're going to a park that has one of these hydraulic launches do that first because you never know if it's gonna shut down and be yeah. shut down for the rest of the day or whatever so when i when i went to knots that's what I, accelerator was the first thing i rode because that's what i was worried about did it close so, down? It did close down a couple times while we were there, but because the lines were so short, whenever it opened up, I was able to just hop right on. So it wasn't necessarily a problem for me and my dad when we were there. Yeah. Um, but the park was also dead while we were there. Like literally, the longest we waited for something was twenty minutes the whole time we were there. Which is crazy. <laughs> so it was so dead. The second day, we left at like three p.m. because That's we're right. like, we just yeah, we just rode everything we wanted to several times. So. I hope it's that way for us when. We go to Cedar Point. We yeah. go to Carolyn's. But yeah, I would. I would not anticipate that. Yeah, don't but, hold your breath. Right? Yeah. So, but I'm hoping we're going a little later in the year. So hopefully, it won't be too bad. So, so Top Thrill Dragster opens, breaks all kinds of records. Um, it doesn't accelerate as fast as Accelerator does. It has like it has a better, a higher top speed, but it doesn't. The initial launch isn't as intense. Uh, let's see. Other hydraulic launch coasters would follow, including Storm Runner, which we've talked about. Uh, they also opened Stealth at Thorpe Park, which is also 200 feet, just like Storm Runner and uh, Accelerator are. Um, lastly, 
the the hydraulic coaster would lead to two coasters that still to this day hold records. So first they would open King Dakka at Six Flags Great Adventure, which to this day is still the tallest roller coaster in the world at 456 feet. So same concept as Top Thrill Dragster, but Six Flags. This this coaster, remember we talked about the Coaster Wars when we talked about Phantom's Revenge? This coaster marked the end of the Coaster Wars. So it was Six Flags was trying to get a one-up on Top Thrill Dragster at Cedar Point. And at that point, everyone was kind of like, we can't keep doing this. <laughs> this has gone on long Too enough. Many new coasters. And so this coaster was built in 2005. And for 17 years, it's held the height record. Because people are just like, we can't keep doing this. I think eventually it will get broken, but I have no it's idea when. Point six. So yeah, just <laughs> a tiny little... So. And then the other record breaker was Formula Rosa, which is... Um, uh, this is at Ferrari World um, over in Abu Dhabi, I think is where it's at. This is the fastest roller coaster in the world. So not the tallest, but it features the same hydraulic launch and goes 149 miles per hour. Whoa. <laughs> it's so fast that they require you to wear goggles on the <gasps> ride because they don't want you getting anything in your eye. Like... From like dust particles or anything hitting you in the eye at 150 miles an hour. This thing is insane. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if I would. You don't know if you'd do it? I don't know. I don't think I would. 149 miles per hour. 90 was pretty fast for me. Yeah. I don't know. That's pretty crazy. Does it go upside down? Does not go upside down. It is pure, just pure speed. (laughs) So, that's pretty pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. So. Um, so yeah, and it's pretty cool that all of these record breaking coasters have followed from the initial, you know, construction of Accelerator at Knott's Berry Farm kind of was the first time, can this hydraulic launch work? And it did. So now can we do all these other things with it? And they have, you know, they've broken all kinds of records with these hydraulic launches. So it's pretty cool. Uh, though Accelerator has been extremely successful, it is not without its flaws, Uh, We talked about all these coasters are notorious for having maintenance issues. The ride had a significant problem in 2009 when the launch cable snapped and severely injured a 12-year-old boy and his father. The park was found to be at fault for being three weeks behind their maintenance schedules. Though, when it went to court, the state did admit that the manufacturer's inspection recommendations were a little bit confusing and unclear. So the park settled with the family out of court to help pay for medical bills and damages. So we don't know what that amount was, but Mm. uh, imagine it was a significant amount. The cable also snapped in 2013, but nobody was injured. And then lastly, in 2016, (laughs) I guess they were running their test runs for the, at the beginning of the day before the park opened. And when they launched the train, it got up to the top hat and just had a perfect amount of speed that it got stuck at the top of the top hat like didn't have enough speed to get over the top but also wasn't slow enough to roll back down it just perfectly got stuck at the top what are the chances? and was up there for several hours before a, a gust of wind finally blew it back down <laughs> the top of the top hat <laughs> like what are the odds of that happening that's hilarious that's funny so intamin made adjustments to the model following accelerator for example If you remember, Storm Runner had a dual loading station. So you could either, when you came down into the station, you could either line up on the left or the right, and they were loading trains on both sides. Accelerator only has one station. Mm. So they learned that the... It slows down the weight, the the amount of people you can get through significantly. So Storm Runner and King Daka, they both have dual loading stations that allows them to pump more people through. Right. And then the coaster originally featured a red paint job that faded to pink over the years. So that's what it looked like up until about 2020, I think. And then um, in 2021, the coaster closed for a fresh paint job that is mainly red, but it also has these orange, yellow, and dark gray bits kind of to mimic like flames, I guess, is what they were going for. Cool. 
So, but you'll notice they left the support structure the same color. Say, it's kind yeah, of interesting. So, an interesting I, paint I kind job, of but... like the old paint job better, honestly. Yeah. This kind of has like a California um, beach vibe. Board, yeah, beach boardwalk vibe. This is kind of like 50s. Um, I don't know how I feel about yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. They both look good. I just think I prefer the old one. So, anyway, not, not a bad paint job. Just I think the old one looks better. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's see. And then lastly, in April of this year, 2022, the ride had another major part break and has been closed ever since. So I rode this in March and April, it had something went wrong. Like there was no injuries or anything. It was just yeah. like it didn't open that day. And then like it just hasn't opened since. Man, that's like a, us with a bat. Right? Like yeah, we just. Bad luck. Well. Oh no. You want to, well, you want to hear something funny? I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the episode, but the bat, when you tagged me in that post that the bat had broken down, yeah, I had posted about the bat on the Airtime Traveler Twitter and Instagram that morning. Like, I, I asked the question of, like, what's an underrated coaster that you love that most people don't? And I said mine was the bat mm-hmm. and posted, like, a picture of the bat. And then later that day, you tagged me, and then I'm like, you jinxed I, it. I cursed it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Well, and like when we went to Hershey Park, Sky Rush was closed. When we went to King, or to Kennywood, Steel Curtain was closed. I'm like, are we Are we cursed? cursed? Are we cursed? We're coaster. And then I wrote coaster this. Cursed. I wrote this and it broke down. So I don't know. You. <laughs> I'm it's, cursed. You're the one that's I'm cursed. I'm the curse. You're coaster cursed. So... I don't know. Some people say the ride is finally done for good. I think that's a little dramatic. Yeah. Um, especially because they just painted it yeah. last year, and I don't think if they were looking for, to get rid of the ride, they wouldn't have just they wouldn't have given it a fresh paint job. Yeah. So um, I've also heard, but I've also heard that the park is just waiting on a part. Which Storm Runner actually had the same problem in 2020 before we went. I mean, it shipping was, on anything. Yeah, crazy. well, and the company's from Switzerland that that, that manufactures the ride. So, <clears throat> in fact, Skyrush. So, so Storm Runner broke down 2020, Skyrush in 2021. Mm-hmm. Storm Runner was down for I think six months before they got the part that they needed, and then Skyrush was closed for I think three or four months before they reopened. So, I'm anticipating this will open back up. Some people are saying it's not going to because of like Top Thrill Dragster had it is, had its issue, and now people are saying that one's going to close. I don't know. Coaster enthusiasts are always like, "Oh no, it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna close." Yeah. So, and to be fair, sometimes they do. Sometimes yeah. parks just close rides and don't even tell you. You know, Kings Island did that a couple of years ago with Vortex. So, yeah, it does happen. But personally, I don't think Knotts has a replacement for this. Like I like when we were reading the coaster bot rankings, this is number two in the park. Right. So I think they'd have to build something else before they can get rid of this because everything else is kind of average. Like if you ask a coaster enthusiast, Knotts has two elite coasters: Ghost Rider and Accelerator, and everything else is just kind of good, but they're not like top tier. Right. Um. So I don't think their lineup is deep enough to get rid of Accelerator at this point. So unless they replace it with something incredible, but I don't think they want to do that. So we'll see. Um, I think it'll open back up, but I did want to talk about it today just because, you know, it is interesting that it's been having all these issues ever since I wrote it. So pretty crazy. I'm the curse. (laughs) Well, the perks certainly went through a lot to get Accelerator. There's no doubt that the coaster is a thrilling addition to the park and paved the way for some of the most record-breaking coasters we have today. And uh, that is the history of Accelerator at Knott's Berry Farm. So, any other thoughts? Any questions? Did I finally answer all the questions that you had? I got, like, you know, a history and science lesson in. There was all kinds of stuff for for Accelerator today. Thanks for not doing math, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into the physics of roller coasters. That's uh, that was not my cup of tea. So. so, I do love this ride. It was a lot of fun. The, like I said, I'm a sucker for a launch coaster, and yeah. that that first launch is, it, it's insane. I don't. Some people say they like the launch on this one more than Storm Runner. I don't know that I could really tell the difference. To me, they were about the same. This one's a little bit faster, but Storm Runner accelerates a little bit faster. Hmm. So I mean, and you know. 
apples to oranges, right? They're the, it's you know to me that they're both really apples. intense and really fun. It's, what apples to no? That's what I mean. Apples to oranges. They're different. Oh. <laughs> I they're choose. not apples to apples. They're the same model, but... I still choose apples. Oh. Well, which one is apples? I don't know. I've never been on this. <laughs> so I guess you pick Stormrunner. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you guys for tuning into this week's episode of Airtime Traveler. It's been kind it's been, of... It's been a wacky episode, but that's good. It was <laughs> fun. Wacky Soapbox. Hey, from the hey! Wacky Soapbox Racers. <laughs> If you haven't had a chance to follow us on any of our social media platforms, go check us out on Twitter and Instagram. We're just at Airtime Traveler. Um, we're posting daily on, over there to have different conversations. You know, this past week I asked people, um, you know, what their thoughts were on if Verbolton was a good replacement for Big Bad Wolf at Bush Gardens Williamsburg. So we're having all kinds of conversations like that over at uh, Airtime Traveler. So. Um, I think next time we are going to talk about something at King's Island. So I said I would think I was going to hold off on King's Island for a bit, and so now I think it's time. I I think I know what I'm going to talk about next week. So um, yeah, we'll be going to King's Island next time, and after that I don't know where we'll we'll be going. So we'll see. Oh, I thought you meant like we're going. I'm like, no, we're not. We just just went there. (laughs) No, we're going to be talking about (laughs) the coaster at King's Island. (laughs) So, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you everyone for, for tuning into this week's episode of Airtime Traveler, and uh, we will see you in the next episode. <laughs>